We have a witness who saw what happened at the World Trade Center. This apparently was uh, a commuter plane that smashed into it with such force that uh, the windows of the Picabago smashed with a big bang. Uh, everybody was very frightened. Did you uh, manage to see what kind of plane it was? No, I couldn't tell. It, it was a smaller plane. It looked like a smaller plane, but I couldn't tell. Not... I'm not really sure. A medium-sized body plane with uh, engines on both sides. Almost like a gray black color in nature on the plane. I uh, would say it wasn't a huge jet, but it was a plane that sounded like it was a fighter jet overhead. I worked right next door at 74 Trinity Place. We heard the first one come in. I, I didn't know what it was. It sounded like a missile. Oh, my God, Ed, another plane just hit the World Trade Center. Another plane. It was a medium-sized plane. Unbelievable. It, it, it would appear, Jim, mm. as if there's more smoke coming from the ground and uh, well, we used to have another uh, we have uh, yes things have fallen to the yes. ground and are burning and we have one gentleman told me he was on the 65th floor standing next to an elevator when the elevator exploded and knocked him out of his shoes another woman said that she was working on the 49th floor and she's seen people in the stairwells with burns broken arms people are passing out of the stairwells from the heat she says there's a lot of heat and smoke it's a horrible scene here i'm live at broadway and fulton allison keys wcbs 880 news all right thank you allison well basically there's people running around down the street all the glass panes that are on the bottom yeah. part of the world trade center are all blown out you, you, you when i first it. heard it and ran over to the window it looked like there was fire on the bottom floor well they're ahead there and uh, all of this, the world... Oh, uh, wait. Oh, my God. A, oh, my God. The building fell. Are you there? The building just fell. You said it sounded like the 4th of July. You heard a big explosion before I, the building fell? I saw it as it was happening, and it sounded as if you had a hundred of those little black cat firecrackers, and you lit them all off at once. That's what it sounded like. It sounded like the finale of the 4th of July over the East River. Oh we just gosh. witnessed some kind of secondary uh, follow-up explosion. 10 o'clock Eastern Time this morning, just collapsing on itself. We have no idea what caused this. Almost looks like one of those planned implosions. As if a demolition team set off, when you see the old demolitions yes, of these old buildings, it folded down That's on right. itself and it is not there God. anymore. If you wish to bring uh, anybody who's ever watched a building being demolished on purpose knows that if you're going to do this, you have to get at the, at the under infrastructure of a building and bring it down. Right now, police have to determine is whether that explosion was caused from the initial impact of the plane or whether it was something that was exploded on on the ground. Generally speaking, for a building to collapse in on itself like that, it would seem to indicate that there could have been an explosion, a bomb planted on the ground that would make the building collapse within itself. By that evening, eyewitnesses and experts alike were rushing to defend the official narrative of events, claiming that raging jet fuel fires melted the steel inside the Twin Towers. I saw this plane come out of nowhere and just Green right into the side of the Twin Tower, exploding through the other side. And then I witnessed both towers collapse, one first and then the second, mostly due to structural failure because the fire was just too intense. When one of those airplanes crashed into... Mostly due to structural failure because the fire was just too intense. When one of those airplanes crashed into one of the towers, it was the equivalent of a, a six-point earthquake. Marlene Davis is the Dean of Architecture at the University of Tennessee. She calls the 110-story tall twin tower tube structures. That means there are no internal columns holding it up. You know, when we saw this yesterday, people said, oh my goodness, there was a bomb on there. There must have been a bomb that must collapsed. must have been a bomb it. below right. that, that, that finished the job. Well, it turns out we heard from uh, experts who said that, you know what, the, the fire on those floors, probably 1,500 degrees. Steel can only withstand so much because the steel structure that holds the building up was on the outside and essentially the building started to melt and it gave way and it toppled. Engineers suspect the temperatures inside the crash areas could have quickly reached well over 1,000 degrees, perhaps approaching 2,000 degrees, beyond the melting point of any steel. They were not designed perhaps to take a direct strike from something the size of a 737 or an Airbus, perhaps fully loaded with fuel. Steel will melt physics professor and explosives expert Van Romero. E even if there was no secondary explosives in the building, hitting the air, uh, having the airplane hit the building where it did, a large amount of weight above the damaged location, um, that damaged location being further damaged by the fire, uh, that uh, structure could no longer support the weight above it, 
and the collapse ensues. Numerous individuals, including some of the architects themselves, would claim that plane crashes were never taken into consideration and that the building was doomed to failure. Hyman Brown was the project engineer on the Twin Towers, the man on the ground in charge of making sure the buildings were built right, the way it was designed. Structural steel is fireproof to last between one and two hours, which it did, and then steel melts. Each tower was built around a central core. That core kept the building up, supporting the tower's so-called dead weight. Oh but when God. steel melts, according to Brown, like dominoes, it falls. Brown says the towers were built to withstand 200 mile an hour hurricanes, the 100 year storm, the worst nature could dish out. But he says an airplane crash never oh entered anyone's God. mind. However, that's not entirely true. Yet the impact of the planes alone did not cause that failure. In fact, tall building designers try to anticipate air accidents. Mark Loiseau is president of a company called Controlled Demolition. When the structure was designed, it was designed, uh, to the best of my understanding, to take the impact of what was then the, the state-of-the-art airplane being used in our country, the Boeing 707. The building was designed to have a fully loaded 707 crash into it. That was the largest plane at the time. I believe that the building probably could sustain multiple impacts of jetliners because this structure is like the mosquito netting on your screen door, this intense grid. And the jet plane is just a pencil puncturing that screen netting. John Skilling, the World Trade Center's head structural engineer, told the Seattle Times after the 1993 bombing that if a plane struck the building, there would be a horrendous fire, but the building structure would still be there. On August 21st, 2002, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, commenced their investigation. NIST is a government agency that reports back to the United States Department of Commerce, headed at that point by Donald Evans and later replaced by Carlos Gutierrez, both Bush cabinet appointees. As part of their investigation, NIST contracted Underwriters Laboratories to recreate floor models from the Twin Towers for the purpose of fire resistance tests. We heard about it on the news. We heard about it right away that the floors didn't collapse. Okay, so they tested these huge models. They're models, but they're huge. I mean, one model was essentially the same size and exactly the same as one of the, of the types of floor sections used. And they tested it according to ASTM E119. They exposed it to much longer fire and uh, temper higher temperatures than we know were, were present in the World Trade Center. So right away there was a problem. And that's August of 2004. The final report was released on October 26, 2005, producing over 10,000 pages. It will not explain the actual collapse of the buildings. They only claim to get to collapse initiation and state flatly that it led to global collapse. The report, admittedly, does not actually include the structural behavior of the tower after the conditions for initiation were reached and collapse became inevitable. We were charged with finding out the cause of the collapse, and we, we uh, found uh, what happened. I think uh, we've scientifically demonstrated uh, what was required to initiate the collapse. Once the collapse initiated, the video evidence is rather clear. It, it was not stopped by the floors below, so there was no calculation that we did uh, to demonstrate that, so what is clear from the good videos. NIST concludes that they found no evidence suggesting that the World Trade Center towers were brought down by controlled demolition. Where would people get an idea like that? One, except for material that was blown outwards, the Twin Towers collapsed into their own footprint symmetrically at nearly free fall speeds. Newton's laws of motion determine how long it takes an object to travel a certain distance in complete free fall. In a controlled environment, an object dropped from the roof of either Twin Tower would reach the ground in 9.2 seconds. The 9-11 Commission report will state, 
At 9.58, the South Tower collapsed in 10 seconds. Even NIST says the tops of the buildings came down essentially in freefall. Judge for yourself. And our conclusion is that the building should not have fallen. Conclusion is that the building should not have fallen that rapidly, if indeed fire caused the, the collapse. And so, in fact, there's one uh, mechanical engineer, Gordon Ross, in the Journal of 911 Studies, has done a thorough in, uh, analysis based on conservation momentum. If the official story was correct, then the heating that was supposed to cause the failure would have been a, a much slower event and it would have been an asymmetric event. For the tower to collapse straight down onto itself is, it flies in the face of what we know about steel and how steel behaves. When we have a failure in one area, then the failures tend to, to continue within that area, and you see an asymmetric collapse, possibly the, the upper section falling off as it twisting away from the tower and falling off. But it, it's very unusual to see the upper section falling straight through the path of the greatest resistance, which was straight down through the middle of the tower. It, it, just, it, it does, just does not add up. 2. Molten metal exceeding 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit was discovered in the rubble of Ground Zero, underneath the Twin Towers and Building 7. Even with heavy rain on September 14th and 21st, a constant stream of fire retardants and water, described as creating a giant lake. These fires would not be extinguished until December 13, 2001, making it the longest burning structural fire in history. Was the jet fuel responsible? Dr. Frank Gale, who was working with NIST, claimed in 2005, your gut reaction would be that the jet fuel melted the steel. Indeed it did not. The steel did not melt. The temperatures that we know existed within the, the collapse, within the debris pile, are physically impossible from an atmospheric jet fuel fire. Cannot be done. I'm curious about uh, the uh, pool of molten steel that was found in the... And... Uh, <laughs> Please tell me about it. You, have you seen it? Why, well, not personally, but my witnesses there found huge poles of molten steel beneath the towers and uh, scientists, some scientists don't think that the uh, collapse of the building could have melt, melted all that steel. Um, first of all, let's go back to your basic uh, premise that there was uh, a pool of molten, molten steel. Um, I know of absolutely nobody, and no eyewitness who said so, nobody who's produced it. Uh, I was on the site, I was on the steel yards, so I can't, I don't know that that's so. You'd get down below and you'd see Molten steel, molten steel running down the channel rails, like you're in a foundry, mm -hmm. yeah. like lava, like, like, like lava. From a volcano. Underground, it was still so hot that molten metal dripped down the sides of a wall from Building Six. However, they do hit hot spots occasionally, and everything stops. There were fires of 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit below the ground. I can't. I don't know that that's so. There's uh, video so of it. Melted around 2,600 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Um, I think it's probably pretty difficult to get that kind of uh, uh, temperatures in a um, uh, in a fire. Well, NASA pictures, uh, thermal uh, images showed those those sorts of temperatures in the basement. Could you send them to me? Okay. My name is Mark, and I'm the individual who was questioning Dr. Gross, and he asked me to email to him those thermal images. When I approached him after his talk to get his email address for that purpose. He refused to provide it to me. I think this is important because it reveals the attitude of the NIST investigators, which is one of willful ignorance of what really happened on 9-11. As well as the molten metal in the debris, it was also observed prior to the South Tower's collapse. Also, a minute and 20 seconds before collapse, large amounts of white smoke begin pouring from the base of the South Tower. The 
three, the concrete, and in fact, virtually everything except the metal inside the Twin Towers was pulverized as the building collapsed. This pulverized material created pyroclastic dust clouds that raced down city streets, coating lower Manhattan in a fine dust. Pyroclastic clouds generally occur during two events, volcanic eruptions and controlled demolitions. Four, steel beams weighing up to 200,000 pounds were thrown laterally up to 500 feet. A cross-section from the World Trade Center weighing approximately 300 tons was embedded in the southeastern corner of the American Express building. This piece would have had to travel at least 390 feet, maintaining enough kinetic energy to embed itself in the corner of the building. What we should have seen uh, in the debris pile was a, a pyramidal shape. If it had been a, a, a gravity driven collapse, we would have seen a, a roughly pyramidal shape or a conic shape. What we actually did see was a massive ejection of, of dust and debris and large sections of steel from well away from the towers, uh, tens of metres uh, away from the towers. That's hard to, to, it's hard to, to see a reason for that within a gravity driven collapse. Five, firefighters and eyewitnesses reported a series of explosions before and during the collapses. And we heard the noise uh, associated with an implosion. Secondary explosion on Tower 2. Some sort of explosive device. We're obviously having a bit of trouble right now maintaining our location because we just heard one more explosion. There was another major explosion. Do you know anything about those extra explosions no, we heard? No, I do not. Were they car bombs? I have no idea, ma'am. The string shook and I heard like an explosion. Do you, do you know if it was an explosion or if it was a building collapse? To me, it sounded like it, it, to me it sounded like an explosion. We heard a very loud blast explosion. We heard a very loud blast explosion. They were taking photographs and securing this area just prior to that huge explosion that we all heard and felt. Not clear now is why this uh, explosion took place when there was some sort of collapse or explosion from street level as though it had exploded up a giant rolling ball of flame and the firefighters screamed run it was this blast of warm air it wasn't hot it was warm and it picked me up and threw me up against the wall of the building i was you were picked up off the ground physically picked up off the ground I remember an explosion at that point i got knocked out i don't remember anything then i got up and i looked out the window because the windows exploded and the street below caved in and at that point there was like fireballs coming up an hour later than that we had that big explosion from much much lower i don't know what on earth caused that about 15 minutes after they made their entry uh we heard a boom i don't know if that was the infrastructure that was going or another explosion uh again there has been a second explosion john just seconds ago there was a huge explosion and it appears right now the second world trade tower has just collapsed all of a sudden i heard rumbling and we all started running away from it the glass like blew out and threw and me onto the sidewalk and I, I couldn't see for like 20 seconds it was like it was like holy hell coming down upstairs and then when we, go, we got finally got to the bottom they were coming out on a mezzanine level there and another explosion came right from it because everyone flying we stuck on the stairs for a while. We finally got down to the lobby. Then we get to the lobby, it was this big explosion. So I was real lucky. I don't know what happened to the people behind me when that blast occurred. And uh, it was actually on the uh, 78th floor of the uh, second tower and was evacuating the tower and uh, experienced all these explosions and made his way back down. We presume because of the initial explosion, there may have been secondary explosions as well that were detonated in the building by these terrorists. There was a secondary explosion, probably a device either planted before or on the aircraft that did not explode until an hour later. I heard a second explosion and another rumble and more smoke and more dust. I ran inside the buildings, the chandelier shook, and again, black smoke filled the air. 
Within another five minutes, we were covered again with more silt and more dust. And then a fire marshal came in and said we had to leave because if there was a third explosion, this building might not last. Eyewitnesses also reported that explosions had taken place in lower levels of both the North and South Tower. Here it comes. Whoa, 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 whoa. They were having coffee in the World Trade Center when the first plane struck. And all of a sudden it sounded like, I don't know where the subway is, but it sounded like a subway collision, a bomb, and it, 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 it was just pounding, boom, 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 boom. and I, I literally thought the subway had exploded. And the ladies that are with me were in the World Trade Center on the, on, in the first building and escaped through the lobby where they report they believe there was a bomb in the lobby. Just got out of the tunnel and, and the poop. The so subway like, tunnel? Yeah. I heard, yes, I was right there. I was in the B, I was down in the basement. Came down. All of a sudden, the elevator blew up. Smoke. I dragged the guy out. His skin was hanging off, and I dragged him out and I helped him out of the out of, to the ambulance. And when I got up to the concourse level, it was just like, you know, like gunfire, and then and then just three big explosions. And even the turnstile was burnt and was sticking up, and they just told us to run. I heard the first um, explosion and the elevator blew up. And as we were coming out, we passed the lobby. There was no lobby. So I believe the, the bomb hit the lobby first and a couple of seconds in the first plane hit. Firefighter John Schroeder arrived in the lobby of the North Tower shortly after the first plane struck. So we're standing there in the lobby. We're getting all together. All of a sudden, we hear... I look down to my right and the elevators exploded something out of like a Bruce Willis Die Hard movie. People just come running out of the lot, out of the elevators, on fire, fireball. I mean, it was like, what is going on here? This something's up here. I mean, the plane's up there, now there's fire down here. Uh, people run around all on fire. This is crazy. So we were heading up to the 24th floor of the stairwell, and all of a sudden we heard Mayday, Mayday, second plane, second plane. Swift. We're looking at each other like, come on, second plane. There's no way there's a second plane. Within seconds, our building got rocked. We got bounced around in the stairwell like pinballs, man. And we just said, you know what? Time to go. We got down to the lobby, and everything was blown out, exploded. Everything was... And we were the only ones in the lobby now. We're going, wait a second here. Where is everybody? Because the building was coming down the outside. They moved to the command post, the World Trade Center, too. So now we're like, we're, 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 no, we didn't get a... We didn't get no... Where, where is everybody? We... We were in the lobby, all it looks like it, everything was exploded, everything was gone. We're like, what is going on here? We didn't know. We were like, this is crazy. But for the ele for the every window in the lobby to be exploded, I mean them windows were like as thick as forget it. There were two, three inch glasses, you know, come on. They exploded out of the lobby, you know, something it, it wasn't it wasn't from the jet fuel. No way. The elevators exploded, they were down from the lobby. The lobby was over here. It, it, that should never have happened. Something would happen there, and that wasn't. That wasn't. <clears throat> we came down. It was. Look, it looked like a bomb went off in the lobby. There was no fire. It just looked like a bomb went off. So, how was the largest and most puzzling architectural failure in history treated? The steel from the World Trade Center was mostly shipped overseas, eliminating any possibility of independent investigations. New York City's Department of Design and Construction contracted four companies for debris removal. Each was assigned a specific zone and controlled and monitored by a three-person team. The operation was so controlled that in November, each dump truck used for removal of debris was fitted with a GPS locator. One driver took an extended lunch break and was dismissed from the job. By April 2002, over 185,000 tons of debris had been removed from Ground Zero. FEMA's Building Performance Assessment Team was not even granted access to Ground Zero. They were granted a tour of the site in early October, but were forbidden from collecting samples or examining blueprints. Out of hundreds of thousands of pieces of steel, 150 were preserved at Fresh Kills Landfill from where FEMA conducted its investigation. When the Twin Towers came down, they released over 500 tons. When the Twin Towers came down, they released over 500 tons of pulverized asbestos into Lower Manhattan, along with lead, barium, mercury, chromium, copper, 
and several other toxic chemicals. 425,000 cubic yards of concrete is pulverized. 600,000 square feet of glass is turned into dust. During the World Trade Center's construction, spray-on fireproofing comprised of concrete and asbestos was placed on the core columns. When asbestos was outlawed in 1971, they ceased this procedure at the 64th floor of the South Tower. The Port Authority eventually realized that the asbestos presented a problem and demolition was not an option. In 1989, the Port Authority estimated the removal of asbestos from both the World Trade Center and LaGuardia Airport would have cost up to $1 billion. By 2001, the cost for the World Trade Center buildings alone would have met or exceeded $1 billion. This money would sadly not be needed. Although it was clear that the air was not safe to breathe, the public was urged to return to Lower Manhattan. Wall Street opened back up on September 17th, and children were allowed to go back to school. Firefighters, police, and rescue workers were allowed to toil in lethal conditions using paper masks from Home Depot, while government officials walked around in hazmat suits. My name is John Field. Um, I was hurt at Ground Zero during the uh, cleanup. Wow, you know, I was only there for five days before I was horribly injured, and I mean horribly injured. Leading up to that day, every day I was there, I uh, complained that it was an unsafe workplace. Someone's going to get hurt. It just happened to be me. But uh, I let him, I, I let everybody know that someone would get hurt. I was there for five and a half days. And nobody told me to wear a mask once. Nobody gave a shit when that piece of steel altered my life. But like the thousands that are suffering and sick, I didn't roll over and play dead. And I know human life takes a backseat to the almighty dollar and that's what makes this country roll and run is the almighty dollar. But you guys somewhere lost, somewhere along the line lost your, uh, your credibility with me. The Environmental Protection Agency, under direct orders from the White House, told New Yorkers that the air was safe to breathe. The administrator at the time, Christine Whitman, issued an internal memo on September 12th, declaring that all statements to the media should be cleared through the National Security Council before they are released. So what happened? The White House changed EPA press releases to add reassuring statements and delete cautionary ones. September 13th, the EPA draft release, never released to the public, says EPA testing terrorized sites for environmental hazards. The White House changes that to EPA reassures public about environmental hazards. September 16th, the EPA draft says recent samples of dust on Water Street show higher levels of asbestos. The White House version, new samples confirm ambient air quality meets OSHA standards and is not a cause for public concern. And the White House leaves out entirely this warning, that air samples raise concerns for cleanup workers and office workers near Water Street. Why all these changes? We were told that a desire to reopen Wall Street and national security concerns were the reasons for changing the press releases. Christy Todd Whitman should be in jail for manslaughter. Christy, go to jail. Do not piss. Go. Just go to jail. Lock yourself up. Um, when I said that, everybody said, don't you think that's a little harsh? And I said, no. Six months later, every politician was saying it. Everybody was saying it like it was like saying hi. I pat myself on the back for having the nerve to, and the audacity to say that. She took orders from Condoleezza Rice, who took orders from the White House. They knew the air was bad. They lied. You should go to jail for manslaughter. For every time somebody dies, James Sedroga, Don Jones, Tim Keller, my close personal friend who I had to go to his funeral, Officer Borgia and the many more that have died. I take this personally now. I take it real personal. You got a, an ex-mayor running for president who claims he helped us. Standing on a pile with a bullhorn, Mr. President and Mr. Giuliani, does not constitute helping anybody at all. The EPA's public release assured people that there was no significant level of asbestos in the air and that instead of evacuating, they could clean their homes with a wet rag. More people will die post 9-11 from these illnesses 
then died on the day itself. By 2006, 70% of the 40,000 Ground Zero workers had developed respiratory problems. Hundreds of them had developed cancer, and over 80 had died. To make matters worse, a large majority of the victims from the World Trade Center were denied a decent burial and treated like garbage. A pile of approximately 500,000 tons of ash located at Fresh Kills Landfill contains 1,148 victims that have yet to be identified. Mayor Bloomberg has repeatedly denied family members' requests, replying, I've only visited my father's grave once, 